Sarah, thanks for making time to talk to me today. It's an interesting time to have this conversation, given that the G7 meeting is opening in Cornwall this morning. And, and what I wanted to remind you of is what um, President Biden has been saying from the US about this being the critical decade to make progress on a whole range of issues. We know that the, the world faces a, a major crisis over climate change. But there's also mounting inequality, there's biodiversity extinction on an unprecedented scale, and plastic is turning up in our food. We really are, I think, as Biden says, in a critical decade for change. And I think it's a great day to have this first conversation about the new Responsible Tourism School that you're launching um, over the next few weeks. And it's no accident that that's happening at the same time as we're working with World Travel Market on a new platform for change, focusing on the key issues where businesses and destinations can take responsibility to make change and to contribute to the kinds of changes we need to see made now very rapidly over the next 10 years. So Sarah, you, um, you were a former student of mine. You've worked in Chile, which is where you took the course from. You're one of the distance learning students based in Chile. And you're now back in Austria. And you're developing, you have developed a whole program of work with SMEs, particularly in the hospitality sector, re re um, reflecting your own background in that sector. I'm I think I've said enough about you. I think we should hear from you. Describe yourself in your own words. So, Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much, Harold. Good morning. Um, yeah, so as Harold rightly said, I did the Masters in International Responsible Tourism Management from Chile. And at that time, I had set up and was managing my own backpackers hostel in southern Chile in a place that um, was seeing the beginning of over tourism and I wanted to see what I could do to make a difference. So that was one of the big reasons for me to do the masters. Um, from there, I moved into working in consultancy and I also took on the marketing for a luxury lakeside lodge. And so the combination of the, that experience of being a backpacker hostel owner and seeing how to develop and market that world and then moving into the luxury lakeside um, lodge world where then I was attending international fairs and um, working forward to see how we could sell a destination that was suffering from these problems and overcome those, those problems in the destination really gave me a great, um, a great founding for what I then went on to create. Um, that change for me happened when, as a family, we made the change to move after for what was two decades for me working across the whole of Latin America, because prior to my time in Chile, I'd been working across the continent as a tour leader. Um, we moved in 2019, which was just before COVID. And when COVID hit, the incredible empathy I felt in a huge rush for all the, the people who were doing exactly what I had previously been doing for so long. Um, the thoughts, the questions, the fears and the worries that came to them um, put me in it, left me in a position where I thought I have some experience in this area and not just because I actually um, managed properties like this. But while I was doing that, we had an 8.8 .8 earthquake in Chile and then five years later, a volcanic eruption. And so on both those times, our reservations were gone overnight and I then had to start the process of rebuilding the marketing the sales pitch um, to get people to to have trust in destinations to come back and so I created some resources and put them up on my new site which was launched just after COVID and since then I've been supporting small and medium-sized hospitality businesses with uh, resources and courses to help them move forward from the uh, the position that we're in right now. Sarah, I think it's one of the things that struck me looking at the work you've done since you completed the Masters, and you were one of them, certainly one of my very best students. But what, one of the things which is characteristic of your work is the focus both on marketing and on resilience, mm -hmm. which is an unusual combination. That's a very good point, yeah. And that came out of experience, really, because um, marketing for me, plus the resilience element, they can't function without each other because a lot of people go into the accommodation business, particularly not really understanding that a huge percentage of the job is marketing. And therefore just to even 
get um, over those fir that first hurdle. You need the combination of both because you need you need resilience and stamina to even do this job. Um, so that was kind of some, how how my uh, my experience move forward in that, and then seeing how the community um, needed to come together after those two incidents in Chile that happened with us really showed me how working together as communities and creating resilience together um, moved us forward and worked. It's interesting you put it that way, Sarah, because one of the banes of my life whenever I've worked in destinations is people misunderstanding what the competition is. It's too easy, it seems to me, particularly if you're running a small business, a b, &B or a guest house or, or a bunkhouse or a, um, a hostel, it's too easy to see the competition as being the, the business down the road. And that's rarely the case. I mean, generally, the competition is other destinations around the world. And therefore, when a, when a calamity happens, like an earthquake or, or um, a, a, a virus or whatever, the, your problem is not really your partner businesses, the, the people in your community. The problem is that people want to, to, to go on holiday somewhere else and mm -hmm. quite understandably. And that's the big challenge, I think, to see the competition as being other destinations where people could choose to go. Yeah, that's right. It was always particularly interested in Southern Chile because um, the big destinations across the world that competed were New Zealand and Canada because of the, the natural resources. And, you know, getting people to make that choice for a country where the first language is not Spanish, this again was, was a challenge that, that I often faced at the international fairs. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's a very good, really good point. As in general, a country that has to work a lot harder to get people to come tends to just by default have a little more resilience about it, I found, particularly in Chile. Do you think that's in part because when it is difficult to get people to come and visit, the community needs to work together more? Is that Absolutely. what drives it, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, that was particularly the case. I can give you a very specific example about Chile, because when you look up Chile for, as a foreigner from the outside, you see Atacama Desert, you see Torres del Paine, which is the big national park in the south, and you hear about Easter Island. And they're the three destinations, and they're what the international um, tour operators sell, because it's what people know. So it's easy to, to sell the first thing that people read when they think oh I'm quite interested in Chile it's a lot harder to move in and say oh we've actually got quite a lot more in between and I was located in that quite a lot more in between area and it was actually the it, Pucon it's called it's the adventure tourism capital of southern Chile and in terms of uh, natural resources and things that you can actually do to entertain you and to have an amazing stay there is there is um, it's incredible you know you can't miss it out but we had a real issue with that because people only wanted the big three or two of the big three. And so what, what actually started in the area where I live was to combine the efforts of three regions. Now, this wasn't just a small village that decided to come together. It was three regions that came together to create the districts of lakes and volcanoes, as opposed to just come to Pucon. And that had more power and that's still growing and still moving forward. But that came from a lot of collaboration and a lot of meetings. And so I obviously have um, a lot of experience in how that works and how that can move places forward. Sarah, as you probably remember from the course, I've worked a lot in Peru in, in the past. Mm -hmm. And one of the big frustrations for me about Peru was people's obsession with Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you go up the, the coast of Peru you go through one civilization after another yeah. and of course then you get to the north and to quail up and you realize that actually Machu Picchu is quite a recent it's a medieval phenomenon it's not really from my from a European perspective it's not even really proper archaeology but when you go up the that coast you realize you go through one civilization after another mm -hmm. and in the context of the G7 meeting that's going on at the moment in in the UK one of the things that was that really I understood from that travel experience was that probably every one of those communities believed that they would be there forever mm -hmm. and that they didn't need to worry about the future, but each of them had destroyed their own resources through the overuse of those resources, mm -hmm. just in the way that we are now globally. And it seemed to me, for me, it was a real wake up call mm -hmm. to the, in the way in which human beings are capable of overusing their resources to the point where they make their own lives more difficult. 
Absolutely. Um, I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah. And one of my favorite books is, uh, is Collapse. Yeah. Um, yeah. By Jared Diamond, which because I have been to Easter Island a few times and I loved the way that the, he brought the, the, that to life before you, you actually visit. If you visit Easter Island, having read that book, it's a very different experience to just going as a tourist. Mm. Yes, I wonder how many of the tour operators and the guides who, who show you Easter Island actually put it in that context. Very few, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, I think it just it doesn't sell it as well as the um, Pacific White Coast beaches and the Moai statue images and uh, story that goes with it. It's interesting, isn't it? Because one of the reasons why Easter Island is as stunning, I mean, it's one of the places I would like to go to and have never reached, but one of the reasons why it is the way it is, is that humanity made it unsustainable and the population dropped and the wildlife came back and we've got local examples of that in Fabisham where I live we're just mm -hmm. looking at opening up an area of land which has had no real human interaction with it for 50 years mm -hmm. and we know that as a consequence of that there's going to be some really interesting biodiversity that has not survived in other places where human yeah. beings have been active and all of that's possible through tourism but I think you wanted this morning, Sarah, to talk a bit about the business case for responsible tourism. Yeah, that's right. It's something that comes up again and again because there are statistics all over indicating that we are in a moment and perhaps the best moment to, um, to, to embrace the fact that there's a, a more awareness of environmental um, pending problems that we have coming forward of climate change. And Something that I do in my day to day work is to to weave the 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 story of responsible tourism to weave actions about responsible tourism into the to make it normal to not make it something that people say what's that or I'm too small for that. And so whenever I do begin because I'm very passionate about it when I begin talking about it, I can sometimes see people's eyes glaze over after a minute and that's what I want to to change. I want it to become so much more easy to understand and just integrated into our daily lives and our choices, not just in our business choices. And so it, it's a great help for me and other people who think like I do to have a strong business case for responsible tourism. So that's a question I'd like to throw back at you, what your thoughts are about that. Well, let me just share screen with you, Sarah. And, and perhaps look at this slide. You may remember this actually from the master's course, although I it's do. a little since then. I feel very strongly that there is no business case for responsible tourism. There are multiple cases, there is not one. And when you talk with a board as I've often done or talk to different directors with different responsibilities, different parts of the case appeal to different people. But you'll remember from the course that one of the things I've always said is don't forget that those board directors that you're talking to and trying to convince those managers also have children. Mm -hmm. And they're worried about the future of the world too. So never forget the power of the argument that it's simply the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. That not to take the action um, that needs to be taken now is something you will be held to account for by your children and by the local community. You cannot just duck the responsibility. So it's the right thing to do. And to be honest, I now hear more and more board level directors telling me that they've been taught about how to recycle by their children and sometimes by very young children. And one of the differences, Sarah, between my education and yours would be that when I was at school, I don't think ecology had been invented. It certainly wasn't in the school curriculum. Mm -hmm. Now it's in all over the school curriculum, most places in the world. There's been a massive change in our understanding. So that for me is the most important reason. And it's probably the main reason why people do take responsibility. But if you look at the job functions, one of the things CEOs particularly are interested in doing is minimizing risk. And that's where the resilience agenda that you've done so much work on with small businesses is really critically important. And you have to ask some pretty hard questions right now about how resilient the industry has been in the face of the travel bans which have come on through COVID. Mm -hmm. We discussed that at great length, but probably not now. There's then license to operate, the fact that you need to have the support of the local community. The local co community can make it almost impossible for you to run your business. 
And nobody wants to talk about these examples. But I remember one, as it happens from the Gambia, where the hotel, small hotel, had managed to fall out with the local community. And at six o'clock every night, the local community turned up at the fence and started shouting, give us your money, give us your money, which is not good for business. Um, but that had happened because that particular hotel had managed to alienate the local community. That alienation takes place in different ways in other places, places where tourists face a hostile environment if they leave the resort and therefore they stay within the resort. So license to operate is critical. Product quality, when you think about the way in which consumers are now more and more concerned about the quality of the food, the authenticity, the provenance of the food that they're eating, the product quality turns on that local connection with the local economy. It's good for the business and it's good for the community. These things all work together. They're mutually reinforcing. Then we come on to cost savings. Now, generally, the, the more locally you purchase your goods and services, the better the quality is likely to be. That's not always the case, but it generally is. And there are massive cost savings in reducing your resource consumption. Um, staff morale. One of the things businesses, in my experience, don't think about enough is the sheer cost of training. And that's both the financial cost and an opportunity cost. If you've got high staff turnover, then the managers have got to put a lot of time into training. So how do you reduce the training costs, both the opportunity costs and the financial costs? You get your staff to stay longer. And how do you get your staff to stay longer? You make them feel really good about the job they're doing. And that's not difficult to do. If people feel good about what they're doing, if they go home and they can talk to their families about the difference they're making to the local community, those people will have a much higher level of uh, commitment to your business and to wanting to work there. People grow in those roles. And then there's the bit that everybody talks about, and I've deliberately come to it second, which is the market advantage of taking a responsible approach to what you're doing. You get better experiences. They're richer, they're more authentic, and critically, I think, they're guilt-free. If you think about how quickly we've managed to turn the tide on riding on elephants or swimming with dolphins. It's because mm. the last thing people want to do is to feel guilty about something they've done on holiday. It's not everybody, of course, there are people who don't feel any guilt about these things, but they are a, a minority. And uh, that's why you so quickly saw major brands walk away from riding on elephants and swimming, mm. swimming with dolphins. And then the bit that people don't talk about perhaps enough in terms of the market advantage is the differentiation that it gives you and the PR advantage, the stories it creates. Mm -hmm. And that's about reputation, it's about referrals, and it's about repeats. There was some co-op research, which I still need to track down, but it was powerful in um, when Justin and I wrote the piece in Vacation Marketing. Um, it's in there and I will drag it out again and put it onto, onto the website link, which is below there. All of the evidence is, is there on the Responsible Tourism Partnership website link that's at the bottom of this slide. But what was absolutely clear from that co-op research is that people are very nervous about recommending somewhere where they're not quite sure that it is respectable, responsible, a good place to be, makes them hesitant to recommend. And we know that in travel and tourism, your reputation, the referrals, the recommendations and the repeats are critical to your financial success, your business success turns. Because if you had to spend as much as you do to recruit every new visitor, if you had to spend that for every new visitor and didn't have the advantage of referrals and repeats, then you would struggle to make the business work. It's a critical part of travel and tourism is those, are those personal recommendations. So interesting. Yes, particularly what you just said, that last part, because at the moment I work a lot with people about creating content and this might seem very far, far away from responsible tourism. But at the end of the day, the content that you put out is what creates that differentiation, that reputation, those referrals and the repeats purely by its quality and the value that you give through it and to by by incentivizing people 
to, no, that's the wrong word, not incentivizing, by explaining to people that creating stories to put into content is what creates this market advantage is a major part of what I do. And that allows me to then weave in the, uh, the RT um, uh, element, which is it's super interesting. It's really, that's really, really great point. I think we need to remember that we, that we are as a species, a storytelling species. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. how we educate our kids. It's how we understand the world. And we see that over climate change. You know, it's taken a long while for people to understand why it is that we have a problem with climate change. Mm -hmm. And it's not until you get that narrative mm -hmm. widely understood. But of course, the great thing about being a small business owner is you have so many touch points where you can create the narrative around your community, around your relationship with that community, about your relationship with the natural environment, mm -hmm. and about why they're having a much better experience. You don't need to tell them that. As Justin Francis used to say when he was on the course, you know, you can tell the difference. I can't tell the difference between fairly traded coffee and not fairly traded coffee. I can tell from the packet, but I can't taste the difference. Responsible tourism isn't like that. You can actually feel the difference in the experience that you're having. And we don't talk about that enough, Sarah. Absolutely. I think that goes right back to the staff morale and the training. I mean, as you remember, Harold, my thesis for my master's was actually it began as customer service. It was focused around customer service. And then very, very quickly, I moved to, to realize that training was such an important element of this. And if you yeah, it's, it's so tangible. If you go somewhere, you you know whether that smile is the fake smile yeah. that a waiter or a front desk staff member or anyone working in the industry has just because they're getting paid to do a job it's very tangible and it's so much easier you know you can't fake the happiness it's it's um it's tangible and that's something that i've worked with a lot through after doing that masters and realized the the importance of training not just to keep staff but as an ongoing um, process to, to involve them in communities. It's, I don't see it as just being a retention strategy. It's actually a way to um, educate staff about the, uh, the improvements that they can make in their own destination as well. And the more they talk about them, the more the people around them take them on board. Um, so yeah, yeah, super powerful stuff. And I think the right thing to do that you talked about, Harold, it's absolutely spot on. I have a four and a five year old um, and the questions they ask, they are second to none. The, the questions they come up with is incredible. Some things that I would never have considered when I was younger, the education systems are so much more geared towards this now. We have a, we have a, a debt to them and we have to get it right. And just in case anybody who's listening to this is thinking this is just a couple of white Europeans um, talking about how important responsible tourism is, what's very striking about the research from Booking.com, Accenture, IBM, Euromonitor, is that actually there are many places around the world where potential travellers are even more committed to a sustainable and responsible approach to their travel than the Europeans are. This is not a European phenomenon. If it ever was, I'm not sure it ever was, but it certainly isn't now. And the evidence is there from the major um, surveying companies who you take very seriously about people's aspirations about where they want to travel to. And booking.com, I think it was in 2017, um, when they published their research, made the point that many travelers are still saying that it's hard to find the kinds of products that they're looking for. And I think that is something that everybody who runs a travel business should reflect on. If booking.com is telling you that it's difficult for consumers to find the kinds of products they're looking for, there's a market advantage if you can help people to realize that aspiration. They have the aspiration, but they're finding it difficult to realize it. And the evidence for all of that you can find on the link there on the responsibletourismpartnership.org website. If you just uh, put in that URL or go to the resources and look for the market case, you'll, you'll find it there. All the evidence is there to convince you and anyone else that you need to convince. But Sarah, the point of this interview this morning was to launch the, the school, the Responsible Tourism School, which I'm absolutely delighted that you've taken on. It's something I've aspired to do for a long time but I need to face the fact that I don't have as many years left as I've already enjoyed. Um, it's 20 years in 2022 since the Cape Town Declaration 
I don't think I'm going to make it to another 20 years. So it's really important to me that people like you are stepping up to the plate and taking on the responsibility to launch this training school, which will be a sister organization to the Responsible Tourism Partnership that I run with Caroline Warburton. So absolutely delighted that we're launching that today, Sarah. I don't know if you want to just say a few words about this as we come to the end of the of the interview. Yep, for sure. Thank you. And thank you for entrusting me as well with what I feel is going to be an ongoing um, project to and will make a lot of big changes to a lot of people's businesses. The idea behind the school will be a platform where there will be free resources available, of course, focused on responsible tourism and actions you can take. And then it will be broken down as time goes on for individual businesses, for destination managers, and also for advanced study. So there's going to be um, progressive um, uh, education that you can go through there and you can pick shorter courses as time goes on there will be longer courses of course available and yeah the idea came um, from conversations between myself and Harold and the fact that I absolutely love teaching I love tourism and I'm committed to the power of training to make differences so for me it's a perfect synergy of all those things and yeah the, the, the first courses will be available over the coming months and more and more will be added to that as time goes on. So I'm really excited to get started. And this is the first step forward. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks very much, Sarah. I, I wish you every success with it. And certainly I'll be there uh, helping as much as I can. I, it's one of the things I miss in my retirement, my supposed retirement, is, is the, the direct working with students. Although it has left me more time to do other things. One of the exciting things that's going to happen over the next 18 months now is the launch of the platform for change and a lot of the training materials that you'll be developing relate to that program of work that we're undertaking with World Travel Market and in 2022 we'll be marking, I don't think we'll be celebrating sadly, but we will be marking 20 years of the, the responsible tourism approach. There is a, a deeper critique of sustainability and that whole approach now developing. Um, and I think we'll see more of that. We need people now, as Biden says, this is the critical decade. This is the decade when people need to step up and take responsibility. Um, John Swarbrook and I are the first two members of the advisory board for the new responsible tourism school that Sarah is going to head up. Um, and we'll be bringing in other people in support of that. You'd be a very big part of the responsible tourism movement, Sarah. So thank you very much for agreeing to take it up. And thanks for your time for this interview this morning. Thank you, Harold. Have a great day. And you. Thank you. There's a lot of work to be done. There is. <laughs>